Good morning, everyone. I thank all of you to join me here. I, I would like to present my thesis work on a semantically enhanced approach to identify depression indicative symptoms using Twitter data. The past decade has seen significant uh, innovation in technology for connecting people across the globe. Here are some mind-blowing statistics which say uh, the use of a smartphone has increased over the time and is still growing, the number of internet users, and the use of social media. So this, these figures show that technology has mirrored the real life into our social media life. Human beings are social animals. When it comes to social media, what do we like to talk about? We talk about technology, we talk about politics, we talk about events, and we also talk about health. What do we talk about health on social media? Some people seek treatment. Some people offer treatment. They guide you about the treatments. Some people share their after-treatment experiences. Some people seek support. Some seek suggestions. And some knowingly or unknowingly share their symptoms. So when I say knowingly or unknowingly, there are health problems when people him themselves, they are not aware that they are going through certain kind of health issues. One such healthcare issue is depression. When we talk about depression, we are talking about more than 300 million people across the globe. Out of these 300 million people, approximately 16 million adults in the United States who had already who have at least one major depression episode in their lifetime which is 6.7% of total adult population in the US. Over 90% of the people who, are, who commit suicide, they go through a de depressive disorder once in their lifetime. Looking at the se uh, severity of this, last year in 2017, uh, April, World Health Organization started a campaign called Let's Talk. So when we have seen that people suffering from depression, they do not come out in public. They do not talk about their depression because there is a social stigma attached with it. But this is our surprise that when it comes to social media, people open their hearts and then they express themselves quite a lot. So what kind of things people uh, refer or write on social media? So as I have shown you earlier that People talk about different things in health, so awareness is one of the things which this tweet mentions. I have insomnia, and if you are reading this, you might too. This is a symptom of depression which people have mentioned. This is one more symptom of depression which has been mentioned on Twitter. If we read this tweet, the person is actually sharing the experience after the treatment. According to a report, <coughs> artificial intelligence is making a contribution in the healthcare industry. And this contribution is valued more than 1.4 million in 2016, which is still growing and it is estimated to reach $22.7 million in 2023. I have talked a lot about depression, but now it's the time to understand what is depression, how does it cause, and what, are, what is the impact of de depression on our lives. Depression is a mental disorder. It is also called as major depressive disorder or clinical depression. It is characterized by 
persistent feeling of sadness, lack of interest in the activities person used to enjoy earlier, and so on. What causes depression? So we know any changes in the brain chemistry can lead to depression, but there are many factors which can initiate the onset of depression. It could be genetic, it could be hormonal changes, it could be substance abuse or a combination of these. Depression is known to have negative influence on individuals, family, and personal relationships. It affects work or school life. It, it affects all the aspects of our daily living being. This is not it. There have been studies which relate uh, depression with chronic diseases like cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, etc. Is depression comorbid? Yes. There is a report from NIH which says depression and anxiety occur in most of the cases together. One thing about depression is it does not discriminate. So what does that mean? Any level of education, any level of finances, men, women, old, young, depression can happen to anyone. Does depression look the same in everyone? No. The symptoms are very much different in every human being when it comes to depression. Depression affects different people in different ways. For example, the symptoms are different in men, women, older adults, children, and teens. Now, I have talked about social media and I have talked about depression. The, how do we fill this gap between the two? These are two totally different domains, so how do we fill the gap between the two? So we get domain knowledge in the form of patient health questionnaire. We get social media access by using tweets, and there are many more things, but here in this study, I have considered Twitter data. So to fill this gap, this brings to my thesis statement identifying the major depressive disorder indicative symptoms and use it to identify the severity of depression using social media. So to achieve what I mentioned in my thesis statement, I'll explain the things here in this order. First, I'll take you, to, take you through the PHQ-9, which I mentioned as patient health questionnaire. Then I'll go through some studies which has been already done in the field of depression. Then what I have designed, a framework for achieving uh, for my proposed approach, which contains data, data set design, feature selection, and then we will discuss some results. And then I'll conclude uh, giving the future work and an application use case to this study. PHQ-9, Patient Health Questionnaire. It is a nine-item questionnaire which is used for screening, monitoring, and measuring the severity of depression. It is a self-administered version of primary care evaluation of mental disorder, which is prime MD. It is usually filled by a patient, and it is scored by a clinician. Now, what is PHQ-9? What is this questionnaire? So we have here nine questions. Question number one is little interest. Question number two is about feeling down or depressed. Question number three is about any kind of sleeping disorder. Question four is about feeling tired. Five is about changes in the pattern of eating. Question six is feeling bad about yourself. Question seven is uh, for concentration problems. Uh, question number eight is about moving or speaking slowly or very fast so that people notice it. And question number nine is related to thoughts of suicide or self-harm. So how does this PHQ-9 is scored? So the patient is asked in the last two weeks how the per person has felt about those symptoms. So if the 
in the last two weeks, if there is no mention of that type, that symptom, it is given a CHQ9 score of zero. If there are several days, then it is one. If it is more than half the days, then two, and nearly every day is three. <clears throat> Now, PHQ-9 does not give us a range of days for having those uh, criteria. So just based on intuition, I have come, across, I have come to these ranges which are given as uh, not at all as zero. Several days, uh, because the next category is more than half day, so I have taken it as one to six. More than half the days is seven to 10, and nearly every day is 11 to 14. Have you seen ever uh, anybody else use these particular numbers in terms of day range or this is what just intuitive <coughs> for you? So for this, I have gone through the, uh, the study on uh, PHQ-9 where they have introduced it. Mm -hmm. I have also seen a survey paper where they have uh, uh, surveyed all uh, other kind of questionnaires like uh, CESD, uh, BDI and also PHQ-9, but they have not mentioned this uh, range in those cases. And other papers which are related to depression uh, from De Chaudhary and uh, you know, other, other studies, uh, I haven't seen this value, so I had to come up uh, with some intuition. Mm. Uh, it seems did, did you read our paper? Sorry? Did you read our paper? Not all, but uh, whatever my understanding is, uh, they have not. I think he's talking about as your Asunum paper, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because it mentions the two weeks. But you are not mentioning that you read it somewhere, so that's, I'm just... You know. uh, it, it's there, two weeks. Okay. So in that two weeks, how do we define these categories uh, are for not at all several days and uh, so on. These are the ranges defined in between those two, it's that two week period. Two weeks is part of the standard anyway. Yes. But in, be in between that two week, how do we categorize these four things that uh, values are uh, mm -hmm. given here? So two weeks is uh, uh, the time actually for, for patients? Yes. So the question itself tells the patients to uh, give the results based on their last two weeks of experience. That is the standard according to PHQ-9. And this, when, uh, when a person goes to a clinician, they, when the person is monitored, they keep doing that two week uh, period again and again. Now when we have calculated these scores, how the depression severity is calculated is based on uh, this chart, which is uh, standard from PHQ-9. So if the score lies in 1 to 4, then there is no mention of, uh, it is not um, considered as any depression severity. When it is in 5 to 9 range, it is mild. 10 to 14 is moderate. 15 to 19 is moderately severe. And 20 to 27 is severe. The color coding is, I have used it because we are going to use it in uh, further references. PHQ-9 also uh, proposes uh, treatment actions based on the severity level, level, but here I leave it for the uh, clinicians. So I'm using Twitter. How do we identify a tweet is coming from, is related to a particular symptom. Here are a couple of examples for that. So if we read the, th uh, the first one on the left, it talks about insomnia, wakefulness, um, restlessness, which is pertaining to question number three, which I showed you earlier as sleeping disorder. This tweet, two reasons why I am fat, I eat when I'm bored and I'm always bored. It gives us two symptoms, question number five, and question number one. Question number five is about eating, and question number one is about uh, little interest, so which comes from board. And similarly, question nine and question four. Uh, uh, here, I uh, these are the real tweets, so I had to use uh, some words. I apologize, but uh, they have to be here. Now I'll take you through some important studies which have done in which are uh, which have been done in the field of depression. I have not covered all these studies. There are a lot many, but I'll take you some important, but not limited to only these studies. So in 2012, Park and others 
they have studied on Twitter data. They have explored the use of language in describing this uh, depressive moods. They found that the use of words related to negative emotions and anger significantly increased among Twitter users who showed major depressive disorder symptoms compared to those otherwise. But when it comes to positive emotion words, they could not find any difference there. Basically, they have not done more study on that. In 2013, Dave Chaudhary and others, they have also used Twitter data for identifying, for predicting the likelihood of depression. So these candidates were also chosen based on uh, the people who, have, who are going through depression and then they have collected the Twitter data using their handlers and they have used, instead of PHQ-9, they have used CESD, which is Center for Epidemiologic Studied, Studies Depression Scale. In 2015, Carmen and others, they have employed a dictionary-based approach for determining an overall depression score to individuals. So what we have seen, a depression score, they have tried to do that. They, what they do is simply count the number of phrases from their dictionary in the corpus. And based on that, they give a score to the uh, patient. In 2016, Malvasi and others, they have predicted the severity of depression in the posts. So they have used a mental health forum called reachout.com and on the the, forum, the post from that forum, they have given a severity in a color-coded uh, mention, and when it crosses amber, so green, uh, yellow, amber, and red, when it crosses amber, they, they say that they are building a system which will send out a no notification for, uh, the, to the clinicians or the family members for the severity. What? What techniques they use and roughly what size of their evaluations were, do you have an idea? Um, I have it. Uh, I can uh, tell you uh, after this. In 2017, our own group, uh, Yazdawar and others, they have done a semi-supervised approach to find the clinical depression symptoms on social media. They have used a Twitter, uh, Twitter data again. They have used self-reported users. Self-reported users, when I say the Twitter profiles, which mention some kind of depression-related <coughs> words in their profile. So they have picked up those, profile, those users, and then they have uh, detected the clinical depression symptoms on that uh, corpus. This study, which I have also chosen as a baseline study, it was done in 2016, and then in this study, they try to classify all the symptoms of depression on Twitter data. The study from Maori et al. and others from 2016, they have, they classify first the tweets as depression related or not, and then when the tweet comes out to be depression related, they classify it in different symptoms of the tweet. I'll talk about this study a little more because I am choosing it as my baseline. So they have used the features for classifying depression-related tweets as engrams, use of first-person pronoun, sentiment subjectivity terms. So this is not basically a sentiment value, whether positive or negative. They have, ha they have a, uh, a set of words which gives them a related to uh, which gives them an idea related to a sentiment so all these things they have taken as either present or absent so what changes i have done uh, i'll explain that in my framework for that study with that study so i have taken some tweets pre-process them, which basically means I've removed all the stop words, the URLs being used, and cleaning a little bit of uh, the tweets. 
then these pre-processed tweets are given to a first stage classification, which is a binary classification model, which tells me whether the tweet is related to depression or not. If the tweet is related to depression, so in the first case, I label the tweet as 0 or 1, 0 for not related, and 1 as related to depression. If the tweet is labeled as 1, I send it to a second stage classification model, which is a multi-label classification model, which maps the tweet to all the symptoms which could potentially be present in that tweet. And after we label these tweets, we find the occurrence of these symptoms based on PHQ-9. Just an example. So I have a tweet, forever waking up with puffy eyes from crying all night. So after pre-processing, what I get is forever wake up, puffy eyes, cry all night. Now this tweet is sent to a binary classification. And since it contains the terms wake up, all night, cry, which is related to depression, it gives the label as one. Now since it is labeled as 1, it goes to the second stage classification and here it provides the label S2 and S3 which is feeling down and trouble falling asleep. Now the question is, why do we need a two stage classification when we are classifying the symptoms? So here is an example of the tweet. This is why hatred and panic is setting in white Anglo-Saxons from both countries are afraid to get their own treatment. This tweet has some words which are highlighted here, hatred and panic, but this tweet does not talk about depression. So we need to remove these kind of tweets before sending it for classifying the symptoms. That is why we do a binary classification. So in my first stage, this tweet will be discarded and will not send to a second stage classification model. Now, how does my data set look like? So I have a tweet, then I label it as first in the first column as depressed. If it comes as one, then we label the other nine symptoms, whether they are present or not. So first uh, tweet, zero interest in this economy or swampy and so on. This tweet talks about a financial crisis and financial economical uh, depression. So this tweet is labeled as zero. And since it is zero, we do not label any of the symptoms on this. The second tweet, have no motiv motivation for anything to do with the school anymore. So this shows lack of interest. We classify the tweet, we label the tweet as one, and then label the symptom, which is sim as one, of little interest. Tweet number three, which we have, which we have seen before. So here if we see the the text which is highlighted in red, forever waking up and all night, it relates to sleeping problems. The word crying relates to feeling bad or feeling down. So we classify, the, we label these tweets to symptom one and symptom three. So um, you're talking about manual labeling, right? Yes. At some point, uh, will you be telling us? Uh, you said you crawled that those many, you know, tweets. Uh, yes. You meaning uh, these are part of our campaign, or uh, you did something separately? So I have uh, written a separate program for it because uh, the lexicon size, what we have, is too big. Uh, that uh, I mean, if I have to do that, then all the campaigns running on uh, uh, running in noises have to be stopped for some time. It's almost like 1,200 keywords. And where do you get 1,200 keywords from? Uh, these 1,200 keywords are coming from... Uh, Mari? No. Uh, the lexicon which is uh, given in uh, semi-supervised approach from us. Uh -huh. so, in that... So, so why did... Why is in that... Uh, uh, campaign itself, uh, all the 1200 words not used, or are they used all the 1200 there? There is Hussein here? <coughs> huh? Yeah, so the depression campaign doesn't have all of those words because we have an initial depression campaign and then we created the lexicon, right? 
So those words were generated after we collected data from Twitteris. <coughs> no, but you did reuse the, the previous data set, right? She says he doesn't see. He took 1200 keywords and ran a campaign. I thought Twitter alone allows 400, so I don't understand. Yeah, so that is the reason I had to uh, run this uh, uh, separate with by using different credentials. Uh -huh. uh, I had to run this uh, separately to incorporate all those 1200 keywords. Mm -hmm. Okay, that should be. So you ran it three times or four times uh, with different uh, subset and then through union of those tweets or something? Or what, what did you do? Uh, how yes. do you run? How do you get effectively 1200 keyword based? So uh, tweets that are then ultimately 2.8 million tweets. So I have divided them because these uh, the lexicon generated here is also symptom wise. It's not a total bunch of 1,200 keywords. It is also distributed in nine different symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I have run uh, seven uh, programs for that mm -hmm. using seven different credentials uh, with the, the number of. Uh, so you mean seven credentials, but basically targeting all the nine uh, uh, questions. Uh, so these nine symptom, nine questions, they are reflected in the lexicon as uh, uh, nine different parts. So one question has its own lexicon. Uh -huh. uh, similarly, all nine questions have their own re lexicon, uh, respectively. Uh -huh. So I used those different nine set and created, uh, uh, passed into my program as keywords to. So basically, you, you you have one crawler per symptom. So not exactly because some of the it, the number of, of them, the yeah. number of keywords are not exactly same in all the symptoms. So where I had less number of keywords, I just merged them because there is uh, no point uh, saying that if I run it symptom wise, I'll get the tweets symptom wise because they can have uh, uh, the tweets which has one keyword from one symptom, but it is also containing symptom, uh, the keyword from other symptom which we are not passing at that point of time. So it was uh, just a combination of these things. So this is what my data set uh, for the training. We have annotated 12,356 tweets. And then after labeling for the uh, first stage, I have figured out 7,044 tweets which were not related to depression and 5,300 tweets which were related to depression. These 5,312 5, tweets were annotated again for symptom which was given uh, this kind of labeling, all multiple symptoms. So for all these nine symptoms, which uh, we have got the tweets, the total number of tweets are uh, listed against the symptom number. Here I want to mention that the sum of these uh, numbers, uh, 662 plus and 679 and so on, is more than the number of uh, uh, tweets of which we have got related to depression. The reason is one tweet can have more than one symptom. So some tweets had one symptom, some had two, some had three, and we have also seen few tweets uh, which were having four symptoms in it. I have a question. Yes. Uh, are these symptoms increasing in strength? So is like a symptom one will be, you know, a, a minor symptom, whereas symptom nine is a severe symptom? PHQ-9 does not differentiate between the, uh, okay. I mean, it does not rank the symptoms, basically. Okay. So because, I mean, all these numbers, they look similar, okay? They're all 600. Yes, 90, so that was, that was the reason for uh, uh, choosing it, because we do not want it to have a lot of class imbalance in, uh, in the data. Okay. Now, after creating the data set, what was the features I have chosen for performing all these activities? So I'll revisit the features which I have uh, mentioned uh, for the baseline and then compare it with the features I have used. In the first stage, 
in the baseline study from uh, Maori et al., they have used n-grams, unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams. They have used the presence of personal pronouns. They have also used a sentimental subjectivity terms uh, as a, a binary presence, either zero or one. For second stage, they had a lexicon-based matching, directly keyword to keyword match. If the keyword is present, then it goes to that uh, classification. Uh, it uh, goes into that center. So I have, uh, I have performed these steps. When I performed these steps, I, when I came to sentiment terms, it did not give me a good indication for classification. We have seen tweets which have negative words in it. And that is either, so all these depression related tweets will have negative words. That is given. But there are tweets, they also have a negative, uh, emo, uh, negative uh, terms in the tweets even when they were not related to depression. But they also had depression related words in it. So sentiment terms, did not, they was not able to distinguish between those tweets. I have performed n-grams and the presence of personal pronouns which worked well for me. For second stage classification as they mentioned, lexicon based matching was done. So if a particular phrase or a particular term lies in the tweet, it classifies that tweet into that symptom. The problem with that there are a lot of terms which we cannot handle in our training data. Because training data we can only have limited. It is manual labor of annotation. So there are <coughs> tweets. So if I just use the lexicon based model, it is probably not the best approach what we can have because we are missing out a lot of information present in, in the tweets. So a lot of tweets are coming as false negative which can give me a good indication for the severity of a patient. For that, I have used the semantically enhanced approach using the word to work model. The word to work model which I have used, I have trained it on the corpus of our tweets which were collected by using the depression related lexicon. After, after training this model, I have calculated the word embeddings for all the nine symptom lexicon we had. I have also calculated the word embeddings for all the tweets present in the corpus uh, for my training data. Then the matching of uh, these uh, symptom-based values and tweets was done. So finally, we have got a feature vector of nine dimensions, which had similarity values of all the nine symptoms as one of the feature. Okay, so, so where did you learn the word embedding from the training set? Yes. So which is 12,000, no, 12,000 minus 7,000, so 5,300. Uh, no, so the total, uh, were, uh, the total model was uh, trained on uh, uh, the total corpus what we have got. The 2.9 million tweets she had uh, from using 1,200 keywords is what she thinks yes. she related it on. So on that, the entire corpus of uh, uh, Three mil almost 3 million tweets, I have trained the model on that. Oh. So, I, I, you know, I don't know enough about this thing, but we'll, you know, most, in most studies I would see people use the general corpus, like Twitter corpus, very large corpus and whatever is trained on Yeah, that. but yes. so but, but here we, for, for example, we cannot do, make the following claim. I mean, you seem to imply that we improve the recall somehow because the earlier crawl was keyword driven. Yes. And that's not going to happen because we are restricting our training and everything to what was syntactically done. No, which is okay, but I just think that we should make sure we don't overtrain. Yeah, so I, 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 I
So here I would say the claim is I would guess the claim is uh, that those keywords you use is semantically representative of all the concepts you want to uh, claim. The rest of it is not that relevant. Uh, in the suppose you went to the junk Twitter cap, cap, you know uh, corpus, the rest of the words that are not already in her keywords bag is not. They're not that relevant, uh, so let's just stay on that. So that semantic part comes from yeah. somehow. Uh, yeah, but we did bias the input somehow. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I think we need to think really carefully about uh, the and the cons. If we use the Twitter-based uh, Twitter cor Twitter corpora for uh, this uh, already trained uh, Twitter corpus, in that case we have the tweets which is which is not any domain specific, which are generic tweets uh, there. So there are 400 million tweets which are generic. And then if I try to use that, the similarity is not calculated based on what we need. So if I use my own model, the similarity, basically it is uh, using the it is actually ranking the tweets based on what I need here uh, in this corpus. So what happens is that if you use a general Twitter corpus and then find the similarity, then that is your reference point based on which you are computing your similarity. While in here, if you have trained it on your, your, your corpus itself, it gives you that these two tweets, based on whatever tweets that I had, are more similar to this third tweet. So those kind of information um, is, uh, that kind of information is something that you can get by, by, by training from, from your own corpus. Your, so when it goes your into own, the... Your, your own um, analysis showed that 60% of the tweets are not relevant, right? You, when you did manual annotation, uh, you about 12, from 12,000 you showed that 60% uh, you know, of them are not actually uh, this <coughs> However, these three million will consider sixty million of them to be all, also not relevant. Yeah, but that's true. But 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 the important point See, better is better than that, uh, general corpus, obviously. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's better than general corpus. Another important point is that these tweets are from the similar users who anyway tweeted about the depression related. No, that's what she didn't do, right? She just did the. There's there's no selection here based on users. The selection purely based on. Oh, uh, okay, okay. I mean. Um, Users in Asana paper that was the way it was done. Yeah, no, but users who anyway used those kind of uh, words, mm. so that's why it's it's somehow more relevant mm. than considering the. Now, if it, there was a, an attempt done, where mm -hmm. of the three million tweets, roughly two point nine million tweets, if you uh, even did a level of filtering where say which of these potentially are self expect self expect depressing. Mm -hmm. The number probably will end up being a few hundred thousand, well below one million or three million. That, uh, oh, profile does indicate of uh, some Twitter. Now you'll have a very strong corpus of ones that uh, are, or um, um, you could have started because, you know, I don't know, I would, I would have added uh, the corpus of the tweets we had in the Nam paper where they were all users who, had, who were self-expressed. Uh, depressed people. That would have been very good, uh, you know. Although I think that will be, I don't know, what is the size? Anybody remembers? Number of tweets? Uh, so, the, uh, once again, I'll come back. So, uh, you're asking about the size of the tweets which were crawled using uh, self reported? Hmm. I guess that is somewhere around 22 million tweets for 40,000 users. Well, that's a larger corpus than what you have. Why not train on them? Because they are, that's, uh, uh, those are self-expressed depressed people. Yes. So that's even and more. And uh, when I am coming back, uh, coming to my results, I'll discuss this thing. Okay. Uh, I have a question, sorry, yeah. yes. uh, with the training. So did, uh, did you do a reliability test? How many annotators and how well did they agree with each other? Yes. Oh, yes. So, for yes, example, yes. did you split up the, the 3 million tweets and then you have your training data set, which was 5,000, and then you um, analyze with this the rest of the tweets 
which no, you no, so the word to act does not work that way. So word to act, what it finds is that by training word to act, what we mean is that get me the representation of two words such that if I calculate score between two words, I find I can find out how similar they are. So so the training of word to back is different than training of other classifiers that that we that we mention usually. No, oh, but uh, for the symptom labeling, you still need to annotate. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's so, that's a different case. I, yeah, I, I thought he was asking about word to act training. Uh, mm. uh, no, uh, I was asking saying. about so you annotate five thousand tweets, uh, you annotate symptoms, and yeah, then, then you that. use that as a training set. Yeah, that that, for, that she has for, done. Yes, for yeah, the rest of the three million. But what you should so here is the annotator agreement what we have so when I annotated for the first stage uh, the user agreement came out to 0.83 and for all these symptoms it came out here no I wasn't talking about annotator agreement I was talking about so you take 5,000 as training data for 3 million what if this 5,000 is different from the rest so what you do is you take 5,000 you analyze you use this for training data for another, let's say, 10,000, and you see the accuracy between those two, if they predict really what you train. So that's a reliability test that you do. No, that. but for that you need another 10,000 as, as labels. Yes, so you need three, three, three so, so, sets. Yeah. Training data, then you do the data and you need to predict yeah. the data. Yeah, so, so what, what we usually do is that out of the 5,000 labels that data that uh -huh. we have, we split that into training and test data. Ah, okay. Yeah, and and that and and from that we provide the results. Okay, the and that happened. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was yeah. just yeah. wondering. Hey, let, let, let me just summarize. I think I'm getting lost. Yeah. So 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 you have a large data set of three million. Yes. Right. And then initially you have a classifier for whether a tweet is depression uh, depression related or not. Yes. For this, the training set is uh, five thousand three hundred tweets. No. For that, the training set is uh, 12,000 uh, odd tweets. Oh, OK, yeah. So 7,000 non uh, So when I pass these 12,000 tweets to this binary classification, which gives me whether it is related to depression or not, then the result which I found was almost 7,000 tweets, which were not related to depression, and 5,000 odd tweets, which were related to depression. No, th those were the hand-labeled ones. Yes. Right. So twelve thousand you hand labeled. Yes. And so you use that as a training corpus for the first stage. Yes. Now among the five thousand, you further annotated based on symptoms. Yes. And that gave you nine separate classifiers. Nine labels. Yeah, but there are nine separate classifiers. Uh, I mean, how did you use those nine uh, separate ones? Okay. So one tweet. Mm -hmm. Let's say two symptoms. Yeah, so you had two different classifiers telling you that those two symptoms exist, right? No, we have this multi-label classification for that. I'm not using different types of classification for uh, giving different kind of symptoms. So you have one classifier with nine uh, results? Yes. Yes. So one classifier gives me nine labels as zero or one. So which one is present as one, which is absent as zero. So is. Okay, so I, I think I understand that. So, so now you tell me, tell me what is word embedding doing uh, in all this? Okay, so when I'm labeling this, mm -hmm. there were some of, so for doing this, I need some features. Those features mm -hmm. when I was selecting as uh, the words coming out from lexicon as was proposed in the baseline approach, my these 5,000, because it is not a good enough number of tweets uh, annotated, these 5,000 tweets did not contain all the lexicon uh, keywords present in that. So we are missing the pattern for uh, those keywords which were not present in this training. So when that particular term comes here in, in a new tweet for test, mm -hmm. it was not able to identify whether this goes in which symptom this tweet. So it was giving me a lot of false negatives. Okay. So to reduce the number of those false negatives, I have trained this uh, word to vec model. Now this word to vec model, since it is trained on 3 million uh, tweets, it has 
it has the presence of the entire 1200 keywords what we are using hmm. in that 3 million because it is that 3 million tweets were crawled based on these 1200 key, uh, keywords. So it has the presence of those 1200 keywords. Those 1200 keywords, because now we are finding the similarity, it will give me a similar score even if my training model did not, so this 5,000 tweets did not have the term, but it is similar to a term which is coming from the word to work model. So if this similarity level is high, then that, level, uh, that particular label is present. Okay, let, let me think a little bit more, but yeah. I, Kind of see what we are, what you're trying. Somehow, to. some query is ex somehow some mm. expansion being done based on mm. corpus that was based on 1,200, you know, keywords. Right. So basically, the 5,000 did of. not cover the lexicon terms, and so I, I still need to understand exactly the implication of word to work. But but yeah, yeah, go on. I mean, I partially agree with you in terms of features, but the models haven't seen it. The model hasn't. The multi-labeled classifier has not seen it. So, so that still would get affected. Yeah, I'm a little confused between how, so, so I, I understand how do you train a word to a word embedding. Mm -hmm. Now how do you incorporate into the classifier, I'm okay. not entirely sure. So my model is there, mm -hmm. uh, this trained model of word to vec is there. Yeah, so for every word I'll give you a vector. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. so my tweet mm -hmm. based, because this, is, this, uh, this model is giving me word for every, uh, mm -hmm. vector for every word, this tweet is converted to a vector based on this. So you take every word in the tweet, get the vector for it, and maybe do a mean or something. Uh, oh, I, I actually did some. I tried min and max, but uh, and some, and some performed uh, better out of these three things. I okay. summed the words of all these uh, word vectors mm -hmm. to create a vector for one tweet. Mm -hmm. Second thing, we have the lexicon for nine different symptoms. Mm -hmm. And every set of symptom has some keywords, 100, 200, based on whatever the number we had in the lexicon. Mm -hmm. Using that lexicon, I have created a word vector for that particular symptom using this model. Mm -hmm. So now I have nine vectors for nine symptoms and one vector for one tweet. Now I calculate the similarity between this vector and these nine vectors. And these nine, so these nine combination give me nine similarity scores. So now you're claiming that it beats the baseline, is that after doing all this? Yes. Okay. Uh, Anything else on uh, the feature selection? Um, I'm not clear actually about the impact of each feature on like uh, identifying all those mm -hmm. symptoms and like uh, how you'll pick first feature the basic like features, how does it help in capturing all those One second, one second. I, I just got lost. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, okay. So I was like, I, I like, yeah, like the impact of each feature in identifying those symptoms, how do you, like, how do you use it? I'm still not clear about that. I am not able to understand the question again. So impact of in your features in yeah. classification. What happens in baseline is that you consider every word of your tweet and you match it with the symptoms, keywords identified uh, for every symptom. So you are doing keyword uh, no, yeah. Exactly, the keyword match. And that is, that is for baseline. Uh -huh. If that symptom is present, then you um, create a number one as your feature one. That's how the baseline is representing your tweet as a feature vector. Uh, actually, the thing was like we did something based on the lexicon, right, Joy? So there was on the keyword on the lexicon matching, and there was uh, like a large number of noise, like not yeah, even th th those kind of things happen, and that's yeah. that's what she noticed. Yeah. Then so so now yeah. what she did was instead of doing this keyword-based match, she 
considered a context based map. So that context was generated uh, based on the word to act. Uh, so that context is basically the word to act context. So, so actually she is giving some kind of a similarity score. Yes. And it is just the one feature you are passing. So, 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 so what, what happens is that now one tweet is represented by one vector. Yeah, yeah, I understand yeah. that. So and now, then yeah. you calculate, compute the symptom, then you come up with one cosine similarity one score. One cosine similarity for each feature. So now each tweet has nine cosine similarity. So, so that is your feature there are vector. nine features. Uh, exactly. So yeah. you are passing nine feature to the classifier. Yes. Okay. Yes. And is that performed well, like uh, with the nine features? Oh, I have one question because we were there. So why, why not just pick the, uh, the the feature with the highest similarity and forget the rest of the algorithms? Then uh, why did you go with uh, building classifiers after that? Yeah. So what happens is that you need to define a threshold for each feature. That above this threshold, you consider this to be significant enough to to consider this tweet having this uh, uh, symptom. How do you how do you define that 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 kind of thresholding for each feature? Yeah, the machine learning. Exactly. Algorithm. So you rely on on something uh, like this. Learning. It would also be better if she had shown with a TCLE graph, right? She she could have plotted that. Okay, these are the symptom and the within the cosine similarity, like these are the two is which are because now it is very hard for us to visualize. Mm -hmm. Like what is actually happening and like how those cosine similarities are computed. Like not, not that much intuition. Okay. Um. I'll uh, add that to my uh, thesis document. Yeah, actually, let me just verbalize what Swati is saying, and that's exactly what is Shweta. causing me concern. Shweta, <laughs> Shweta sorry. Uh, so, so, so here is my issue. That I actually, I clearly understand what you're doing programmatically. I have no problems with that. But on the other hand, I cannot foresee the impact of everything that you're doing. Even the context that word to embedding is trying to drag in. It's hard to figure out. So my, again, my old suggestion that I have been giving in the past is explicitly show us some tweets that have uh, occurrences of the keyword or are missing keywords or things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And then with your word to uh, VEC embedding, what new things are either captured or, or not captured or something like that. And that will be a good uh, set of examples to include. So you can clearly verbalize the impact of some of these things. Okay. I'll uh, uh, do this. Uh, and sorry, Shweta. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after performing these uh, activities, I have uh, reached to a, a result of uh, uh, the algorithms uh, employed uh, by using these uh, feature sets. But before uh, going there, I would like to introduce uh, precision recall Hamming laws, which are the evaluation criteria for in terms of multi-label classification. So we see it is basically uh, related to multi-class. But what happens is in multi-class or binary class classification, the label is either predicted or not predicted. But here we are talking about a set of labels given to a tweet or uh, any example. So it can have three possibilities now. It can either correctly predict, it can either falsely predict, or it can predict it partially true. So how do we take all these things? I'll represent it with an example. So here are some formulae for uh, uh, the evaluation criteria for uh, multi-label. So we have two tweets, tweet, tweet 0 and tweet 1, which are represented as in terms of uh, predicted labels and actual labels given to it. So first tweet is given S1, S4, S7, S8, and S9 as predicted. Tweet 0 is also given actual S1, S2, S4, S8. Now, using the formula we have given, we find out the intersection between the 
predicted and the actual labels. For both of the tweets, we have calculated it. Using the formula. The point is, could this be done respecting of respecting the way those scores add up in PSQ9? As suppose so would you have come up with closest possible um, you know severity prediction or the you know the score the PSQ9 score uh, by the choice that you're making that will be defensible otherwise yeah, she, she has we, we have those she results has she has that evaluation yeah so this is how with an example we can see there are three labels which are common in there and one label which is common in here and then we take the average on the whole corpus on all the incidents. So here we have two, and we uh, so this is how we create precision, uh, calculate precision for multi-label. Same way we do it for the recall. The Hamming loss is actually the Hamming loss is how many labels are incorrectly predicted over the entire sample of incidents. So we, we, we want to minimize the Hamming loss. And this is, this is how we create, calculate Hamming loss in this scenario. Now about the results. So I have employed first level classification, second level classification, and then come up with these uh, two approaches. So we have seen all these uh, evaluation criteria which are mentioned here. We have, and this is the baseline approach what we had. We have used the same approach on our uh, data set and calculated the difference between the two. So if we come to F1 score, we clearly see there is almost a 20% improvement over the, the baseline results using a word to vec model. Now, whatever we have done, this is the final results. So what is BR and what is CC? Uh, binary relevance and uh, classifier chain. Now, what we have done, is it substantial, what, what we can do with these labels predicted from the tweets after doing all that exercises? So here, I have taken that application to find out the depression severity. I'll just go through quickly what we have discussed about PHQ-9, that it gives us the range of none, mild, moderate, moderately severe, and severe. And I have also shown there a color coding, which we will see in the next slide, why that was chosen. Wait, so, sorry. Yeah. This is what I asked before. So yeah. this non mild, moderate, moderate, or severe, severe, it's within the PHQ-9, right? Yes. The more symptoms you have, the severe it gets. Or what, how was that defined? Or was that defined on the... You don't have to go back. No, no, no. I'll just show you the... This is the actual PHQ-9 form looks like. Okay. So here are all the questions mentioned. I, I just want to know severe. What is severe? Severe is answering question 9, for example? No. Like, it's weighted. No. It's weighted. Okay. So it, it is given and then the occurrence of all these things are summed up here, and we get a total PHQ-9 score, and that score has the range, which I showed gotcha. uh, in the okay. previous uh, okay. slides. Right. So here I have three different uh, bars for all the five users. These five are different category users. These are uh, I'll, I'll explain about each user when I come back to this. First, I'll explain this uh, graph. So the first, the dark blue bar which you see is coming from the labeling of the tweets by baseline approach. So we label the tweets according to the baseline approach and then calculate the severity of depression based on the number of days they have tweeted it. So number of days, how we have defined, I uh, showed in uh, the previous slides. Same way for, for all these five users, yes. 
So how did you select these users? Is this just random and then you filled out the PHP 9 questionnaire yourself or is this Good example, question. Examples, right? So the tweets which we have labeled, right. I have grouped them by user. And then I have got multiple users. I have randomly chosen those users. Okay. The reason I did not go for a user which is self-reported or random, I'll explain here why, what was the reason behind that. So in the case of first user, we have seen the baseline approach if we label the tweets as baseline approach and then calculate the severity of depression, it goes in the mild uh, zone of uh, depression and it gets the score seven. By using my own approach, we get the dep uh, depression severity in moderately severe zone. And it gives the score of 16, because more tweets were, were labeled in this case. So, so you, you can show that we take the same tweet script? Yes. And then the first one will hold, let's say, three tweets responsible for some symptom? then your approach will say no, five of them had symptoms, so like that, right? So, what I did when I grouped by the users, I have picked the users, then went back to their two weeks tweet, mm -hmm. picked them up, annotated it, which uh, gives me the ground truth here in this case, and then I passed those tweets to my model, mm -hmm. it, and it gives me some symptoms, and passed it to the baseline, which gives me some symptoms. I'll just, yeah. That ground truth thing is important. Yes. How did that come about? How, how do we get ground truth? You By manually annotated the You. Tweets. Yes. Not her. I think there were three. I mean, uh, th those annotators. I mean, were there clinicians? <laughs> Unfortunately not. Okay. And did they know how your system works? Nope. They had no idea because these tweets we have uh, in, uh, annotated before we employed the system. I have changed the approach after getting what but, kind of But I would suggest you actually include these examples, I think, that will actually make a big difference. Uh, tweet examples. Tweet examples. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the annotators, so there are not clinicians, and they were just giving the tweet, right? Not the, there was no context of the tweet. Tweet, right? So we had these guidelines to uh, annotate the data. So the first stage, it is basically the intuition of the annotators. So, so yeah, I mean that's a problem because when people talk about something funny, for example, they will say, "Oh my God, I'm dying." <laughs> you see that, and um, or I feel like dying, or you know, yes, let's say yes. I feel like dying. And you see that and you annotate that. I would put that in depression in this context. Not necessarily, right? I mean, if the human understands the sarcasm or... Um... Oh, that's a big thing. I mean, <laughs> understanding sarcasm is depending on culture, so where the annotator oh, is from, or where the tweet is from. Absolutely, absolutely. That, but the point, that's where the whole thing is, right? Mm. Uh, the, the whole game is to, um, uh, to come as close to a general human uh, but there isn't yeah, any agreement. We know very well that uh, there is uh, often not as much uh, agreement, and even the two humans won't agree. Um, I remember uh, uh, two experts who were educational experts, and we were annotating uh, some data sets uh, related to answering questions of fourth grader. And they themselves agreed only 61% of the time. Well, you know, two mm -hmm. teachers agreeing 61% of the time on an exam question. I yes. mean, uh, you know, I mean, they, you know, both of them are qualified, you know, sure. in their domain. Sure. That's what you can get. But so, so, you when, so you don't expect a system to really build, uh, you know, I mean, the system is wrong 30% of time. <laughs> What's wrong? No, but if you have the context, hmm. for example, if you look at the tweet and it's a reply to something. Yeah, yeah. And you see, you know, the initial tweet. Yeah. And you, but yeah, you can improve upon, you can do better annotation by... Uh, b very good guideline by interlocutor agreement by giving additional context of previous tweets or what is this in response mm -hmm. to certainly you can do all of those things better and I don't think that that is all all, all those things was done this was just a very basic uh, yeah you know, so we have employed these approaches so we have created these guidelines that and again obviously it is uh, based on uh, annotators intuition what label they provide so Earlier, when we started this study, 
we had only uh, multi class classification <coughs> model binary class and multi class in that case the user uh, the annotator was forced to choose only one symptom even if it shows more than one symptom and that is where the annotation agreement was very less that was that did not even cross uh, 40% because it was all based on uh, the annotator and three different annotators we could not uh, uh, go beyond 40% yeah, but, in that but, but there the problem wasn't properly specified and that was the issue right but looking at a tweet because the agreement doesn't make sense in that context right because each one is if you have two symptoms and each one is forced to pick one and they happen to pick the different ones yeah I yeah that was the problem and that is why we went to describe all the symptoms what user is saying so obviously if they are disagreeing that means it is the pr the presence of those two different uh, annotations is there and that is why we annotated it in a, in a uh, different labels yes i think you can get rid of all of this brouhaha by simply being clear about what you mean by ground truth this is just an independent evaluation okay. so and then, then then all these complaints will just <laughs> <laughs> so when I say ground truth, yeah. <laughs> so th this one set of tweets, which is the past two weeks tweets of a user, which is randomly chosen from uh, these uh, annotated, uh, these labeled tweets, mm. the ground truth is human annotated labels for those tweets. Non-expert human observers. Unfortunately. Yeah. No, that's fine. Just be, just be clear. Yes. That's all. So that it's is fine. But for this, we have employed three different kinds of, I tried, the one mm -hmm. was native English speaker. Sure. And one was me, we did not have any choice. And one was uh, the person from an accounts department. So we <laughs> tried to incorporate three different views in okay. the uh, terms I, of Actually, my, my overall so, expectations uh, are very modest. Yeah. Yes, actually, I don't exactly. want any fancy I English. Mean, if you miss any sarcasm, I actually don't have a problem. I just want you to just convince <laughs> us with examples that a simple syntactic approach is flawed hmm. and using this word embedding and all the other uh, more enhanced one does improve matters. As long as you can show with some examples and quantitatively, I'm fine. You okay. miss all the sarcasm, I have no problem. Okay. Because if, if a human <laughs> being has issues, then I don't have a problem forgiving the machine for failing. Right. Okay. Yeah, and um, Gita, if you also point out on the, if you have done some error analysis, like where your system fails, because mm -hmm. now it is like very good, right? Do you have any plans to like uh, open source your data and code? Yes because we are also doing something, so we don't want to do again from the beginning. So if you can like publicly open your data as well as source code, it would be helpful. So right now it is um, on my server. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, clean everything, I mean, uh, in a proper way, and uh, uh, put it in, uh, uh, we have that uh, noise is open source. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I have plans for that. You can do that. that yes. Would be well because I've already labeled everything, and also if you can like uh, show if you put your these and show like how the board embedding, just like Dr. Prasad told now, and also if you can show the error analysis, like where your system fails, so that we can improve upon that rather than you know doing it from scratch. Right. Yeah. So if you can just show us all those. So with that, I will, I mean, with the annotated data, I'll uh, uh, create a document which will explain now uh, everything on I this. I think you will produce pieces, right? I mean, it will be there on yeah, the, yeah. that if you can include. Sure. Thanks. So here we see, <clears throat> for user one, here we see when we have annotated all the tweets as ground truth, it goes, it gives a different score, but it still is in the same range, uh, same zone of severity as uh, our approach is same zone uh, of severity as in ground truth. <laughs> After analyzing this uh, user, I have also figured out that this user self-report herself. So the reason why I have not chosen a self-reported user and randomly picking up comes here in this user form. This user 
has a high severity. It goes into a moderate level of severity in depression. But analyzing this user, we do not see that it reports it in the profile. So that was the reason we have not gone through users. We have gone through tweets to users. What percentage of your um, Twitter of each uh, you know, level hmm? are uh, self-expressed? Oh, uh, I need to look into that. You go from content to, you know, the... Uh, I did this exercise uh, last year using our lexicon and checking their uh, uh, user profile. So earlier we had a data set of almost 300 million users from uh, Surendra who has crawled uh, based on different generic users and their uh, profiles. I have gone through in that and from those 300 users I have figured out a little over 3 million users who were self-reporting themselves. So that I did last year, but statistics change you know, very frequently in this case. So, if, so even when I was trying to do this, I tried to go back to that list and check if I can find some user who's just self-reporting. So at that time, the user was self-reporting, but now they have changed their uh, uh, user profile. And now it does not show. Well, you have the user ID. You just go to the you know write a program that goes to their profile and see if they yes appear to be same, that is what same way a Sonam paper uh, identify them as self express Yes. So, so why I did not choose a self reported user and go no, that is fine. Why you did not choose the, the post analysis mm -hmm. would uh, say okay, this is I, I, I look at. Yeah. All my users, uh, I you know, first of all, none of your five is in severe level. Mm -hmm. um, one is in moderately severe level. Two are in, you know, one is in. So, so you can say, well, uh, my. Uh, in your case, what? Two point nine million. Yes. Uh, based on this, say uh, two point two point nine are divided to all these levels. Mm -hmm. And of each of the moderate and moderately severe and severe, mm -hmm. what percentage are also self-express? And suppose you find, oh, 60 percent of moderately severe also have self-express. You have a good basis to argue, and um, say only 20 percent who are mild are self-express. That is a result that kind of you know it makes intuitive sense. Okay. It may be interesting if you have user handles. Can you see? See, what they are tweeting now and... Uh, so this is all based on um, uh, four, no, uh, from April 3rd to past two weeks from there. Oh, right. No. Yeah, this is recent. User 2 and User 3, they are showing one category where they these users I have chosen which were showing only those three or four symptoms which is given in the uh, baseline approach. So baseline approach does not classify all these nine PHQ-9 symptoms. They classify only three symptoms, disturbed sleep, fatigue, and uh, depressed mood. So it was not a justice with user one that I have taken all nine symptoms here and comparing with all three symptoms. So I have taken th these two users which were showing only three symptoms. The most interesting part which I find was this one, the user five. This user was tweeting re tweets related to depression, but these were infrequent tweets. Like when I say in a day, so first day it is present and then it is not present for next three, four days, five days, and then one day it comes up. Why I say this is important because according to PHQ-9, we are not counting the frequency of tweets in a day. So there we are lacking one information because one day's tweet can give me one more idea about the uh, person's uh, mental health. Let's say an example, uh, which I discussed with you earlier. Suicidal idea. If a person is tweeting about suicidal idea, 
but once 50 tweets in a day that is alarming because if he is tweeting that much in a day it might happen that the person ends up committing suicide on that particular day so we should also consider these kind of things but phq9 since phq9 does not give us in those guidelines i have not used it here so that saying that i conclude this uh, uh, word we have seen that twitter can be used as a good data set for calculating the severity of depression our approach was successful in extracting more symptoms as compared to the baseline we can do an automated phq9 completion by using just the feeds from social media we can also use other health related knowledge sources and do the same kind of exercise to find the severity in those posts did you not really present any uh, comparison with the past research and uh, uh, the, of course there is there may be problem of apple and orange mm -hmm. uh, but which is your closest uh, competition to the past you know those five examples you gave and then you know how would you say either are you better or additive or alternative that that kind of analysis we need i need to see right so uh, the baseline approach what we have taken i am showing the graphs there how they using them mm. using that approach mm. what kind of severity level of that particular user we can but find. now you have to argue that the baseline approach was wrong then your uh, and uh, proposed system and oh i see you have ground truth uh, no baseline approach what you saying is that it's only extracting three symptoms mm. so that's so it's going to be by definition well, the body, point here is yeah. people would say that so you you have chosen a very stupid mm. baseline right that's right so for see, that so I, i want to know if the baseline also tags it as depressed or not depressed yes. over and beyond the extracting the three symptoms yes so as i explained when i was going they also have a two stage classification first they tag it as depression related or not and then they pass it to the second stage which tells the three symptoms uh, they classify them into three different symptoms so for that when we are comparing three symptoms to three symptoms we have this user 2 and user 3 so there the patient is showing only three symptoms which are present in the baseline and then i compared with my approach and baseline with the ground truth you you're showing your five users how many total users you have done this one this is just five examples right these are five different kind of users yeah five just five users randomly picked right mm -hmm. or score and code randomly picked that's um, what you're showing here so i have gone through i mean i have gone through more than the five users but five is not at all representative you have 2.9 <laughs> million you know tweets and of that maybe uh, one plus with 1 million users and you are showing resume for 5 what does it tell you what does it tell so dr shit the the actual comparison is in terms of the tweet label identification yeah. that she got as a 20% of the improvement in app score now this is just an example okay. of of that so the the difference from the baseline to her approach is only the word to whack based matching and mm -hmm. an enhanced dictionary so that is the part being evaluated first in form of f1 score improvement mm -hmm. and second in form of this an an example application that what the, is okay. that 20% of improvement substantial enough to drive the decision from mildly depressed to moderately depressed and the answer is yes for mm -hmm. this five These examples, examples. Yeah. yeah yeah so the question is that is this sufficient here to uh, argue that indeed that 20% is very accurate, uh, meaningful you know it's uh, uh, the previous study was done on very different data set and uh, the you know, purpose how, was same purpose was same yeah that is i then given a tweet get me the labels of this what are the five labels yes what are the php and it was also for two week period the, their work was also yeah. for two week period. Actually, the way I would use these five users is to actually show their tweet. 
See, to okay. me, that is much more meaningful than the I mean, abstract they're numbers. like pop. So if I say for user one, uh, there were for two weeks, it was like uh, 1080. No, you can clearly say that, uh, hey, these uh, baseline extracts mm -hmm. pulls out uh, these three tweets and misses these four tweets. And that's what yeah, our you, approach pulls yeah, you out. Want to show, uh, okay. wait, because you're showing me those where, numbers, right? Where did they get four from and where, how, where did you get eight from? Eight, for yeah, user so two? you're that's doing twice you're as good, right? So, I mean, same thing with the first one, that's seven and 18. Oh, so seven and sixteen. In yeah. this case, I won't say it is twice good because. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm saying yeah, show yeah. All, thing, all <laughs> that you need to do is get those Just seven tweets, yeah. get those sixteen tweets and eighteen tweets. So we, we have an understanding of what was missed, what was identified, how did it improve. I don't think this is seven and sixteen. I think that's a score. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, but, but, yeah, yeah but, but it corresponds to a tweet. Exactly. Yeah. But it may be corresponding three, four, four tweets giving you seven scores. Yeah, that's fine. That, that's the, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so we've been looking at trees. I want to step back into the forest for a minute. Um, I think you can make a little bit stronger argument about the application's relevance of what it is that you've done. Because it looks to me like your baseline uh, has no implications for intervention. Okay, so whatever, none was you don't do anything, and seven was, I don't remember what it is, watchful waiting or some such thing. Um, but when you get into the moderate range, that's when it becomes important to have higher vigilance. And you haven't really made the argument about the operational significance of, of uh, the, the greater sensitivity that you have at this higher range of the, of, of the scale. I think you can do a better job. Yes. So after finding the severity, uh, I was uh, discussing with uh, Devati uh, because uh, uh, she is working on bariatric surgery and depression and obesity are in in lot of studies they have been linked uh, a lot. So with discussion with uh, uh, Devati, we have come up with uh, this a uh, use case of uh, uh, the the severity of depression using the social media. So we can develop an app, like uh, in other uh, bedriatic app they have, we can develop an app which reads all these social feeds from that user. These social feeds are then sent to this two-stage classification model, and then based on PHQ-9 guidelines, we calculate the severity assessment, which can be used for intervention by sending out notifications to their surgeon or the family person. Before you do that, you should. Uh, I think it would really help to um, have clinicians evaluate these things that the people did, and to test, you know, to, in order to see whether your model is predicting, and uh, so what, what clinicians would predict. So when I'm proposing this approach, I am not claiming that this model can replace a clinician's job. No, no, job. no. Just, I mean, we it would just, just giving, help. We are giving an aid to a clinician because. Sometimes when a person goes, we, I mean, it is there in studies that when people go and do that last two weeks thing, they may or they may not remember the entire two week period. And sometimes they are shy of sharing because depression is, is because of social stigma, they do not want to uh, confirm that they are uh, going through depression. So sometimes they are shy and they are uh, not uh, giving uh, giving actual information to the clinician that is also given so this kind of thing can help the clinician say you are saying that I'm not depressed but your activity shows me so the clinician because mental health is more most of the time is counseling and talking they can actually sit with the patient and try to figure out what is the problem going on so this so, can so, be so the point here is that, um, you are, uh, some people are indeed uh, hoping that they can develop a tool that will reduce the, uh, uh, that will, that will uh, qualify people better uh, and alert people better if they have more depression. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the, of, you know, them actually being in doctor's office register and, and carrying out PHQ-9. So this can become a basis for helping them, uh, uh, you know, seek out the help. 
better. The, uh, so, so you can claim to be safe that, look, I'm not going to tell you you're depressed or not, but I'm going to tell you that you do, uh, it, it, you know, you, you are, ex ex you know, you are exhibiting some, some symptoms that may be about depressive, you may want to get clinical help. That could be, you know, his point is pretty clear, some way of validating you, and then you want to, and then you are claiming that this will aid the clinician. I don't know whether it will aid the user who is depressive or it will, uh, you know, claim the clinician by having a uh, clinician uh, second judge, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the person who is potentially depressing, oh, but you are saying you, are, you didn't have this, but your social media says that. Whatever it is, the point that is good here is that if you, in any work, if it is better validated with domain expert, it will be better. Right now, 100% of what you have done is what is in your mind. And with no no additional clinical help, if I understand correctly, that has only so much to go. That, that is only so, it will be accepted by the community only so much. So it will become harder for you to publish in a, a biomedical or medical journal. Uh, in computer science, you can say, I have better uh, base, your baseline, and I can say, oh, I, I did that particular job better than what is what is published before. There is some value to that. Mm -hmm. Checking with the clinician and whether it is going to be useful for a potentially depressed person or you know, just like we, we we had hoped to develop a tool for harassment, potential identifying whether a particular engagement on social media is potentially harassing. Alert that if it's harassing, provide some mechanism for handling it. Uh, is the person using social media? You know, if you if you are going in future, somebody is going to develop a tool and your techniques may be useful. Say, well, how 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 might we realize? And that could be very valuable. Um, uh, you are you are not part of. Uh, the meeting we had, or were you the was it Jeremy Shrum? Yes, I was. So, uh, you know, he mentioned some other clinician, right? Yes. Yeah. So, meeting with that kind of, uh, you know, doctor, showing them and saying, how could I use it? Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have any bandwidth to carry further study out, uh, that would be a useful thing to do. Yes, access to a clinician and verifying it validated in a proper way. <clears throat> so, I spent like two years here, a little more than two years in Noises, and uh, I have worked with uh, uh, other uh, couple of people in Noises. And uh, these were four things which are either in pipeline or we have already submitted. Uh, the first one with the, uh, collaborating with the Saida. Uh, the second one is we are working right now. Uh, it's me, Swati, and uh, Saida. The third one is Saida and uh, I. And the fourth one, which we have done as a class project, and we are uh, enhancing it, and we are trying to enhance it uh, as a publishable work uh, with uh, Swati and Manas. None of them actually accepted it, right? Uh, the first one we have submitted a couple of times, but uh, yeah, it didn't, get it. That's what I'm saying. didn't go through. So uh, we are going to publish it in the, uh, I mean, uh, we are going to keep it in the archive. Hmm. Uh, here are a couple of uh, references. Uh, most of the references were covered uh, in the slides. And uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Shet first of all to give me an opportunity to come here and work in Noesis. And then uh, uh, Dr. Prasad, whenever I had any doubts, I, uh, he was always available uh, for sorting it out. And I got the, uh, the hook to machine learning after uh, taking a class from uh, Dr. Banerjee. It was, it, it actually, taught me the basics, the core of how do we achieve, how do we go through a machine learning process. And uh, I tried to uh, use those uh, learnings from our class, and that's the only reason I use logistic regression in my 
uh, first is stage classification because in one of the classes she said always if you do not know anything about algorithm always start from the simple models <laughs> i want to thank uh, shreyansh manas and swati uh, for uh, helping me out and guiding me in uh, carrying out this study i also want to thank uh, amir working with him i learned a lot of uh, domain knowledge then all uh, the masters group i mean a couple of them are joining phd now uh, but uh, we had a lot of great time a lot of parties <laughs> yeah they were outside noises so and then the whole noises uh, family uh, this is a picture when we had uh, a potluck i i could have more but uh, i don't see anything coming in uh, this uh, month and any more questions <laughs> actually there's a part in 29 right uh, that uh, um 28 28 is graduation yes uh, and uh, i'm trying to find uh, uh, our stupid uh, administration to let us use our funding no. to take out for lunch but uh, you see that and then this meeting uh, some of you guys can join the i think uh, uh, alan's uh, thing uh, in the south door thing so that's okay i have just Please. one question mm -hmm. um, the phq9 and yes. valerie you mentioned that before did you use that because it was used before or why did you use that for some why didn't you use bdi okay so One reason is uh, in the project proposal we are using PHQ9. The other reason, uh, which is uh, more important, that is I guess was the reason for choosing in the proposal itself. There are not many questionnaires available out there for calculating mental health disorder. But in a survey paper I read that PHQ9 is the most concise questionnaire. uh for cal and these questions are most concise and covering almost everything what can be there on for phq9 also to mention here when when it comes to phq9 it just did not does not calculate the severity or uh, scores for major depressive disorder a major depressive disorder is calculated only when the phq9 symptoms are 5 or more than 5 if it is less than 5 they are some other kind of depressive disorders mm -hmm. but phq9 is able to do that i'm sure i mean there will be other questionnaires which will be doing it but i have not studied any other uh, scale in depth so i cannot comment on that i believe that in the literature most of the reporting is based on phq9 yeah, that's because okay. that's what clinicians <laughs> use because it's more practical okay. i think um, yeah that's what i was referring to So if you see in one of the studies from uh, uh, Day Chaudhary which was in uh, 2013 they have not used PHQ9 they have used uh, CESD that is uh, another scale for calculating depression yes so i can answer this discussion as well so traditionally the one that we would use is is uh, for a different subset of patients and it's not a general PHQ9 questionnaire or a depression scale questionnaire whereas PHQ9 um, is more generalized and it's concise as you mentioned and additionally it's quick um, score calculations so the other ones are lengthy in time and uh, it takes a lot to calculate the depression scale whereas PHQ9 is much quicker um, and more generalized than the other settings so would it be accurate to say it's a screening tool rather than a diagnostic tool Yes. Yeah. 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 That's quite okay. Uh, that's a. Uh, I think that uh, we are moving towards you know more deeper knowledge of the domain using DSM five, but uh, for for you know implementing uh, more NLP techniques uh, for this thing as a grading scheme and screening, this is the right thing. It seems like, but so and then just more recently we are working with. one or two additional people with mental health uh, knowledge our project uh, basically is with cornell but we don't have direct access to clinicians at cornell so we are developing local access to clinicians yeah okay yes. okay any if not uh, excuse the audience